Michio, what does it mean uh, for mathematicians to say that their proofs are true? And why is it the case that some mathematical truths are beautiful and others are not? Well, first, what is truth and what is beauty? Beauty, I think, is symmetry. And things are beautiful because they're symmetrical. Because you, when you rotate your point of view, you rotate this object, you turn it upside down, it remains the same, like a crystal. That's why crystals are beautiful. So I think that the source of all the beauty in the universe is the Big Bang. The universe existed in perfect symmetry. All the forces, gravity, electricity, magnetism, were all the same as a super force. There was only one super force at the beginning of time, but it shattered. It shattered, giving us the broken world of today. And that's why we see mountaintops. That's why we see jagged cliffs. That's why we see the messiness of the world around us, because we're looking at remnants, remnants of the original beauty of the Big Bang itself. And then why is mathematics beautiful? Well, and what is truth? Truth to me is logic, okay? And what is mathematics? Mathematics to me is counting. A very sophisticated form of counting, but it is counting. And it is counting that obeys the laws of logic. That is what mathematics is. And so the fact that mathematics works is not a mystery to me. The fact that it is beautiful is a mystery until you realize that at the beginning of time, that was the origin of beauty. The origin of the beauty is the Big Bang. That's where this original symmetry came from. And this symmetry is now embodied into much of mathematics today. Much of mathematics can now be summarized in the language of string theory. String theory is sort of like this gigantic snake that's gobbling up huge branches of, of mathematics. And so string theory is beautiful because it's based on a symmetry, supersymmetry. And we now realize that mathematics also has gorgeous symmetries associated with it. And again, it is true because it obeys the laws of logic. Now, the critic would say, aha, but there are beautiful theories which are wrong. If this is the set of all beautiful things, then the set of all true things is much smaller. <laughs> so all true things, I believe, are beautiful, but not all beautiful things are true. Well, I, I, would, I could argue that, that, that and, and certainly not all beautiful things are true, but I think there are lots of true things that are not beautiful. Uh, no, I think ultimately all truth comes from mathematics, and mathematics in turn is very closely weighted to symmetries, and symmetry, as I said, is, I think, is the origin of beauty. Now, there is a point of view where things get hazy, and this gets us into the incompleteness theorem of Gödel. Mm -hmm. If I start with the statement that this sentence is false, okay? <laughs> if I start with that sentence, it is only true if it's false, and it's only false if it's true. <laughs> you could then take that paradox and then embed it into mathematics to prove that there are true statements which are not provable using your, the postulates of arithmetic. You go crazy thinking about this. So I think there are gray areas, gray areas of incompleteness in mathematics. But even in physics, we have incompleteness, which is the uncertainty principle. So yes, I think that things are beautiful because they're true. But I think that there are limits to what we can know about the universe. And that is Gödel's incompleteness theorem and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Sure. Those are two very important ones in terms of mathematics and the, and, and, and the physical world which limits our capability to sort of deterministically know everything. Right. I, I totally agree with that. But I still would say that there are true things that are not beautiful. An example are there are many times mathematical proofs of different things that go on for 200 pages uh, and mathematicians go through it and it is true and it, it, it proves the theorem. Uh, but it's 200 pages worth and then 10 years later, 100 years later, somebody comes up with a three-page proof. And w that both are, pr are true, but one would say the, that the latter is, is beautiful where the former was ugly. Yet they're both true. Yeah, well, some mathematics is repetitious. Uh, we're humans. We cannot recognize the repetition because we have limitations of a physical thought. But that's why some proofs are very, very long 
but they can be boiled down because of all the redundancies can be removed. And once the redundancies are removed, then there's a simple principle, a simple principle that drives the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So for example, if I drop a leaf, a leaf in the wind, and I would ask you to mathematically describe the motion of the leaf, it would take you centuries, yeah. centuries to mathematically describe how a leaf falls in the wind. But then I simply give you Bernoulli's law, laws of thermodynamics and aerodynamics, and boom, a simple algorithm gives you the motion of a leaf falling in the wind. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference? The difference is that when it's a counting problem, if you count every single motion, it would take you thousands of years to do that. But there's an algorithm that counts automatically for you mm -hmm. the motion of the leaves called aerodynamics. So that's beautiful. And that's beautiful because it's based on a principle. And principles in turn are based on pictures. What is that picture? The atomic principle, okay? Aerodynamics is based on atoms. That's why we can then model by computer the falling of a leaf. And the atomic theory is beautiful. It comes from the quantum theory, which in turn, I believe, come from string theory. Mm -hmm. The fact that in mathematics, uh, with Gödel's theorem of incompleteness, and in the physical world with Heisenberg's uncertainty principles, those are two such fundamental things that describe the physical reality. If you're talking about quantum physics and mathematics, really that, encom that, that encompasses everything. So what does it mean that you have embedded in, at the fundamental level of both of these things uh, some kind of indeterminacy? Well, I That's, think it, that, that should speak loudly to us. I think what it means is that science is limitless. It's infinite. Now, that doesn't mean that the principles of science are infinite. I think there are a finite set of principles that govern the entire universe. Like I said, on a sheet of paper, you can summarize the known laws of science. But the consequences, the solutions of that sheet of paper are boundless. And with the uncertainty principle, you can't even count them anymore. There is, it's uncountable the number of possible universes that you can create simply by looking at a light bulb, for example, and looking at Maxwell's equations. Mm -hmm. And so the point of view is that indeterminacy, to me, simply means that science is limitless, but the principles of science are finite. Mm -hmm. And how about in mathematics? I think the same thing, too, that mathematics, in some sense, is limitless, but that uh, the principles of mathematics, the principles of counting, there are only a finite, probably a finite number of such principles. I can't prove that, but that's my personal belief. But if, uh, if the uh, incomplete theorem says that we can never uh, be sure of a, of a total mathematical system that's totally consistent, uh, does that uh, unmoor our, our sense of uh, the constancy of, of reality? Well, the incompleteness theorem, roughly speaking, simply says that there are provable statements which cannot be proven within the postulates of, of the said system that you're looking at. That doesn't mean they're not true. It just means that within a certain set of postulates, you cannot prove certain correct statements. But if you increase, if you increase the number of allowed postulates, then you can prove a lot more. Mm -hmm. You can prove a lot of things mm -hmm. that within a smaller set of postulates, you cannot prove. Mm. And if you want to eliminate the messiness of these things entirely, you simply say that this proof will not involve systems that are self-referential. S systems that refer to themselves, like I am lying, mm. which means I'm telling the truth only mm. if I'm lying, mm -hmm. these are self-referential systems. If I say at the very beginning I eliminate them, then there are no problems at all.